Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. In this particular module, we are discussing about how you can be able to purify the protein from the you know, cells which are overexpressing the particular clone, right? And what we said is that protein is providing you the different types of uh, options you can be able to use the charge hydrophobicity or the surface area as a criteria to purify the protein and in the previous lecture we have also discussed about the basic principle of the affinity chromatography and how you can be able to use that for purification of the proteins uh, if you recall what we have discussed we have discussed about that the affinity chromatography relies on the interaction between the uh, receptor and the ligand and you have the option of either putting the receptor along with the protein or the ligand with the protein and that's how you can be able to use them for the purification of the particular protein so in a typical uh, affinity chromatography what you have is you have the receptor and the ligand which are you know exclusively being interacting with each other and you have the option that you can actually be connect the receptor to the uh, matrix, right? Or you can actually be able to connect the receptor to the protein. So either of those cases, the ligand has to be placed on the counterpart. For example, if you are putting a receptor onto the matrix, then the ligand has to be placed onto the protein of your interest with the help of the recombinant DNA technology. If the, you're putting the receptor onto the protein, then you are have to put the ligand onto the matrix. So we have a couple of examples which we are going to discuss in this particular uh, particular lecture. So first thing what we require to perform the affinity chromatography is that you should have the receptor or the ligand. The receptor molecule present on the matrix can be produced either by the genetic engineering or the isolation from the crude extract or in the case of antibody it is produced in the mouse or rabbit models. Uh, so you have the three options you can actually be able to purify the receptor either with the genetic engineering or you can isolate the receptor from a crude extract or you can actually be able to generate the antibodies. How you are going to generate the antibodies? So for in generation of the antibodies, what you have to do is you have to first prepare the antigens. If you are, uh, you know, dealing with a protein, uh, which or if you are dealing with a molecule which is very small and it is uh, coming under the category of hapten, then you have to convert the hapten into an antigen. After that, you have to prepare the antigen for the injections, and after that, you have to do the immunization to the animal. You have to inject the animals, right, and then. Once the animal are actually going to produce the antibody, you have to test the presence of antibodies uh, in the animal. And once you see that the antibody is in a very high quantity, then you can be able to extract out the blood and that blood is going to contain the antibodies. And from the blood, you are actually going to collect the serum and the serum is going to be, uh, and then you can be able to verify the antibodies from the serum. So let's see uh, and discuss uh, some of these steps individually. So the preparation of the antigen. So the antigen required for the development of polyclonal antibody is approximately two milligrams. It is required for the multiple injection to induce the boost immune response. Uh, so it has the following steps. First, you are going to produce the anti antigen. So you can you can actually be able to use the recombinant DNA technology to clone the antigen of your interest, and then you can be able to overexpress that in a large quantities. Then you can do the isolation of the antigen. There are two approaches to isolate the antigen from the E. coli ever expressing cells. Uh, purification of antigen under the native condition. So you can use the column chromatography, you can use the ion exchange chromatography or any other affinity chromatography to purify the antigen. Or you can actually be used the antigen uh, under the denaturating conditions. So you can do the electro elution of antigen from the SDS page. Uh, these are the steps what you have to take to uh, isolate the antigen from the SDS page. So first what you are going to do is you are going to run the uh, antigen on the SDS page followed by you have to identify the region of interest, right? So you are going to identify the region of interest. Then you are going to cut the protein bands and you are putting into a dialysis bag. And this dialysis bag you are going to keep into a horizontal apparatus. 
and then you are going to run the uh, you are going to perform the electrophoresis and as a result what will happen is that the protein band is going to be electro from this uh, from this acrylamide block and it will come into the dialysis pack and uh, then you can concentrate the antigen and you can use this antigen for the injections into the animal but you cannot in inject the an antigen as such you have to prepare the antigen for the injections so preparation of the antigen for the injection you have to combine 100 microliter of antigen which is approximately around 100 to 150 microgram with an equal amount of fluids fluids uh, complete adjuvant to a final volume of 200 microliter you mix thoroughly to obtain the emulsion using a syringe or a pipette. After four weeks of injection, inject the second booster dose. Repeat the booster injections four to five times every four weeks to generate a robust immune response and deployment of the memory B cells. Then you, once the uh, antigen is ready, then you can do the in vivo immunization of the rabbit. So. Before immunization, you can just take out some amount of blood so that it is actually going to serve as a control and it is called as pre-bleed or the pre-immune serum. And then you can inject the 200 microliter antigen into the rabbit, which is going to be the NZ strain. So this is the rabbit, what you have, this is the NZ strain rabbit. And during this step, either use a helper to hold the rabbit or use a restraint device to hold the rabbit inject the antigen onto the back of in the rabbit in the form of the buttons so you are actually going to inject the rabbit uh, somewhere here in the form of the buttons and uh, these buttons are going to release the antigen in a very very slow mode then you are going to do the booster so exactly the same way you are going to prepare the antigen except that it's here you are going to use the incomplete adjuvants and that's why you are going to put the boosters uh, once you do the booster, uh, you have to wait for the four weeks and that's how it is actually going to have the uh, robust immune response and it is actually going to produce large quantity of antibodies. Then you can determine the antibody titers. So you can use the indirect ELISA to determine the antibody titers. And then once you see that the antibody amount is very high, you can collect the blood and prepare the serum. So take out the 20 to 30 ml of blood from the ear vein or large quantity of blood can be drawn after the cardiac puncture. And uh, you can actually be able to collect the uh, blood and then you can actually be able to prepare the, uh, you know, the serum and you can actually be determine the concentration of antibody by the indirect ELISA. Uh, then how you are going to couple the receptor to the matrix, right? So once the receptor is being available, it can be coupled to the matrix by the following steps. In the step one, you're going to do the matrix activation. In the step two, you're going to the covalent coupling. And in the step three, you are going to do deactivate the remaining active groups onto the matrix. So you can have the multiple options. You can use the epichlorohydrin mediator receptor coupling. So in the epichlorohydrin activates the polysaccharide matrix by adding the auxiliary groups with three carbon alcohol groups, spacer arm. The activated matrix reacts with the receptor containing primary amine or thiol groups. Receptors are coupled to the matrix by a thioester or secondary amine linkage. It can be able to couple the hydroxyl group containing receptor molecule as well as by the ether group. So in a Polysaccharide matrix, when you add it to epichlorohydrin, it is going to form the activated matrix. And on this activated matrix, when you are going to add the receptor, which is going to have the free amino group, it is going to, uh, you know, get tagged. And that's how you are going to have the affinity matrix. Then you can also use the carbamides uh, mediated receptor coupling. So in the carbamide receptor coupling, uh, carbamides reacts with the receptor containing carboxyl group to form the isourea ester and the activated matrix and then allow to react with the receptor molecule containing the carboxyl or the free amino groups. Uh, receptors are coupled to the matrix by a secondary amine linkage. So this is what has happened, right? Uh, carbamide, when it reacts with the uh, with carboxyl group, it is going to form the isourea esters. And when it reacts with the receptor, it is actually going to form the affinity matrix. Once you have the affinity matrix, you can actually be able to do the affinity chromatography. So in uh, affinity chromatography, uh, what you have is you have the equilibrium. Uh, so affinity chromatography material is uh, packed in uh, an equilibrate with a buffer containing high salt to reduce the non-specific interaction of the protein with the analyte. 
then you can have the sample preparation. The sample is prepared on the mobile phase and it should be the free of suspended particle to remove the clogging of the column and so on. And uh, then you inject the sample with a syringe. Uh, in the illusion, the illusion, there are many ways to elute uh, analyte from the affinity chromatography. You can increase the concentration of the counter ions, or you can change the pH or polarity of the mobile phase, or by a detergent or the cryotypic salt to partially denature the receptor to reduce the affinity for a bound ligand. And once you are done with the illusion, you have to also do the column regenerations. So after the illusion of an analyte, you can affinity chromatography require a regeneration step to use it for the second time. Column is washed with the 6 molar urea or gonadinium hydrochloride to remove the all non specifically bound proteins. The column is then equilibrated with a mobile phase to generate the, regenerate the column. The column can be stored at 4 degree in the presence of 20% alcohol. So this is what you have the affinity column where you have the you know, antibody or the receptor tagged. So when you add the sample, the receptor is going to have the affinity only for the one molecule, right? One of the ligand, so it will go and bind to this ligand, right? And the rest of the molecule are going to be washed away in the washing step. And then you are going to have the receptor ligand onto the column and then you are going to do the elution. So you are going to have the different options of the elution. And that's how you're going to monitor this. So what you see is that the molecules are getting eluted in the elution step. So bioaffinity chromatography is, uh, is a step where you are actually going to do the affinity chromatography. So, okay. so in a, if you want to do a bioaffinity chromatography, you also going to have the, uh, you, you should, you know, you, you can use that for uh, the, even for the antibody purification as well. Uh, I'm sure you, uh, we, we have seen how we can be able to produce the antibody in the serum. So in, if you see uh, all those procedures are uh, very, very complicated. So to just to explain you those uh, procedures, how you can be able to produce the antibody and the antibody, the crude antibody is going to be present in the serum. We have prepared a small demo clip and that demo clip is actually going to explain you the all the steps what we have just discussed, how you can be able to prepare the antigen, how you can inject that into the animals and so on. I'm Amo Karan I work in CSIR, CDR, I don't know. And in today's demo, uh, we will be discussing different steps involved in generation of antibodies in rabbits. So, uh, for the first step, we require several things like trans complete adjuvant, here it is from Sigma. We need a microemulsifying needle which has two openings connected with a fine needle. We need antigen which is purified and filtered so there are no contaminations. It is a sterile solution of antigen. Then we take out some of the France complete adjuvant in Nipendorf and then mix them together. Since one since the this adjuvant is oil based, it doesn't mix easily with the watery system like the antigen is in PVS. So therefore we mix them rigorously, rigorously and forcefully. For that purpose we take these two, we mix this emulsion and uh, we, we, we mix this PVS and PVS containing antigen and the adjuvant, oil based adjuvant. After mixing them we take out in a needle using a needle we take out in a syringe like this and then we fix the microemulsifying needles into it attach another syringe into it like this so once you once you have filled your antigen and the, email, uh, the uh, adjuvant in this needle, you push it here and then you keep pushing from one side, keep pulling from another side, keep pushing from one side and keep pulling from another side. So this process forcefully pushes your material, I mean the oil and the antigen through this fine needle and with that in that process the emulsion is formed. 
Emulsion can be called as water in oil or oil in water because both are in the same concentration, same volumes. So you can call them anyway. So it is it is the emulsion uh, by this method the emulsion is formed. So for ready reference we have already prepared uh, the emulsion. This emulsion looks like white. Initially it was two phase and then slowly it has turned into single phase. Now you can push this emulsion from one field to another side and from another this syringe to another syringe. So this process creates very good emulsion which doesn't separate out later on when you are ready to ready to inject. So how do you check then? So for checking purposes, we drop one of this emulsion or drop a drop of emulsion on the water surface like this. If emulsion is not formed perfectly, this will spread out. Otherwise, it will not spread. So this is a check that your emulsion is formed correctly. So once you find that this drop is not spreading, your emulsion is actually ready for injection. So this was the process by which we prepare the immersion for injection. So this is the first step of preparing the immersion. So now let us understand why we prepare the immersion. We have checked that the immersion is formed. Now the purpose of making the immersion, because you have antigen and antigen, through antigen you can raise antibodies, but after emulsifying them, you actually make the antigen releases slowly. So it is a sustained release kind of preparation so that the antigen is exposed to system uh, in a systematic manner so that the more and more memory cells can be is generated. And that's the sole purpose of having emulsion. Otherwise, if you inject antigen as such in EBS or in other water system, it will be spread out in the body and it will be cleared up by the immune system readily and no memory cells will be generated. So these are this is the purpose, main purpose of preparing the emulsion. So now we have uh, prepared the emulsion. We have come to animal house. This is our rabbit, which will be immunized. And uh, before immunization, we have to take uh, pre immune bleed so that we can compare later uh, the serum and the anti serum. So we will not start how uh, we immunize it. So now we are uh, preparing to immunize. The first and important thing is uh, in all these animal processes is we have to avoid the pain to the animal. So uh, for that purpose we strain, we have to strain the animal because we have to inject. So we uh, strain uh, the animal in a way that it has less and less pain and the movement is also less. So we will inject this into the emulsion into the thigh. We have to catch hold of both the legs and we have to sterilize the area using alcohol. We have to look at the thigh muscles. They should be cleaner, cleanly visible. The skin should be cleanly visible. There are two kind of uh, injection uh, that we give. One is intradermal and another one is subcutaneous. So today uh, we will be doing subcutaneous injection. This is our emulsion that we have prepared by microemulsifying needle. We have seen earlier. This is the area where we would like to inject. We have to take out all the ears from the syringe and the needle.
we have taken out clean the area again and then we apply some antiseptic powder here it is betadine powder so that the infection cannot develop later on the sprinkles enough at the area of injection and then slowly release leave the animal relaxed and it is immunized so this is a button form which is made this is the region with the immersion line so when we have to bleed we have to strain the animal because you cannot uh, you know in general you do not uh, uh, it is not advisable to anesthetize the animal so we use this strainer this wooden strainer where we keep this rabbit here Keep his neck here inside and the head outside. Then we strain his neck using this. Then we strain the rabbit from back side using these kind of cressets according to the size of the rabbit. There are three slots given. And after after using this, we strain the animal from. on the top like this like this and we lock the neck ready and the animal is ready with his head out and the ear outside from here we have to bleed but the drawback of uh, this stener is that if the rabbit is smaller or uh, or Very, uh, uh, depending upon its behavior, if it is uh, uh, panic, sometimes it it rotates itself and and uh, backbone is broken. Its uh, rabbit's backbone is very very uh, uh, sensitive and it breaks. So if it breaks, it has you have to sacrifice the animal and your surgery. So we normally we do not use this, though it is used for rabbit. Really, I mean, I mean, I mean. Another method is to strain the animal. So another method is to strain the animal in a towel or a or a this kind of cloth. So the advantage of having this cloth uh, to strain is it, it, the animal has its claw inside. outside of this cloth and then it cannot move so the, we have to restrict the movement when it is similar in the stirrer and in the on uh, this cloth so we use this bit now we will strain the animal on this cloth and keep the animal relaxed on this cloth and we strain it Make sure that the ear are outside and the animal is trained properly, so as to reduce its movement. And now it is ready to bleed. We bleed the animal from this mid ear vein, ear vein, and we rub it so that it. Gets heated up and the circulation is faster. The vein is will also expand, and more and more flow will be there. So this is the method which is normally we apply. When the vein is properly visible, this is the mid ear vein. Now, which we will fill it. We will slightly sterilize it. 
using alcohol and using a 20 gauge needle which is wide enough to give sufficient bleed we will tip the vein and collect the blood. Then we, to stop it, we just if less and less pain, you can collect the bead like this. Now we have to make sure that no further bleeding uh, occurs. Then we wipe out whatever bleed is outside. Using sterile water, we wipe out all the blood here and there. If if any is finished, we keep. We wipe out all over using water so that the the vein becomes cool and gets sun. Then just check, still it is bleeding, so we keep, keep it pushed. Until the bleeding stops. So now, uh, now I think the blood has stopped coming out and then now we apply some antibiotic here in this case it is betadine powder so that there is no further uh, infections or inflammation in the rabbit and this also ensures that there is this is your pinna and uh, if there is any inflammation it will have some pain so it will, it will avoid that kind of pain also so we have the isolated approximately 10 to 12 ml of blood. This will give us uh, approximately half of the volume of the blood uh, the serum. Uh, this, and this will be coagulated, the blood will be coagulated at 37 centigrade for one hour and then it will be kept at 40 centigrade for one night so that the clot is shrunken properly and the serum is maximally uh, taken out. And then I serve the serum, add some preservative like sodium azide and uh, keep it at minus 20 or minus 80 as per uh, the requirement and then we also taste simultaneously the uh, title of it and the specificity of it using ELISA test and the rest of the test Now you can see this whole of the animal does this animal is I mean, very relaxed it has I think it has very less pain or a negligible plate pain and this is actually very important for handling when you handle only that uh, in whatever procedure you uh, go through with animal, animal should be ensured not to have a pain. Maybe you can, if, if, if the procedure is painful, you understand it is a painful procedure, you anesthetize it. Since this procedure is not painful, you have not been anesthetized. So that this is very important step to ensure that the animal has a pain. So it should be relaxed. So in the uh, whole of the process, I think you have uh, uh, you have got to know all the steps of embryo development in the rabbit, and uh, we have we prepared medicine, we injected the medicine, we isolated the blood after giving sufficient booster doses, and uh, and whole of the process is in the lead. So I 
came to your Mr. Kumasalis process and you liked it. Thank you. Uh, once you collected the serum in that particular step, it is actually going to have the crude antibodies, which means it's going to have the antibody and all other proteins. So you can use the bioaffinity chromatography and you can be able to use that for affinity chromatography. And for uh, antibody purification, what you can do is you have to first couple the antigen onto the beads, right? And that's how you're going to have the antigen, anti antigen bound self rose beads, and then you can be able to load this particular serum as a sample and that's how you can actually you have the uh, washing step then you can have the elution step and that's how it is actually going to give you the purified antibodies so antibody is how you can actually be able to prepare the column right so what you can do is you can use the cnbr mediated receptor coupling so CNBR mediated coupling is more suitable for the antibody to the polysaccharide matrix such as agarose or dextran. CNBR reacts with the polysaccharide at pH 11 to 2 form to form the reactive cyanide ester with a matrix or less reactive cyclic imidocarbonate group. Under alkaline conditions, these cyanogen esters react with the amine groups on the receptor to form the isourea derivatives. The amount of cyanide is more in the agarose whereas this and that. The protein or the peptide ligand with a free amino group is added to the activated matrix to couple the receptor for the affinity purifications. So this is what you have. You have a polysaccharide matrix when it reacts with CNBR, it is actually going to form the cyanide esters and as well as the cyclic imidocarbamide, and that is going to react with receptors to give you the isourea derivatives, and the receptor is going to coupled onto the matrix. And this coupled matrix can be used for the purification of antibody or it can be used even for the purification of the uh, antigen as well. So in the antibody uh, purifications, you can just pack the column with a, with a, with a receptor onto this and uh, you can equilibrate the affinity column with a uh, high salt con uh, containing buffer so, so that it can reduce the non-specific interactions. Then you can wash the column with the 10 column volume using the equilibration buffer and then you can do the elution. So you can use the counter ions or you can use the pH of 2 or you can use the detergent or cryotropic salt to partially denature the receptor to reduce the affinity for the bound ligand or you can use also the beta mercaptothenol or DT2 and all of these are going to release the, uh, the antibodies from the, from the matrix and that you can actually be able to collect and verify. Uh, once this has been done, you can actually neutralize the acidic elute with the help of the one molar tris containing uh, PS7.2 containing 150 millimolar. And uh, once you are done with the purification, you have to do, do the column regenerations. Then we also have the another examples of the bioaffinity chromatography where you can use the GST based, uh, bead based purifications. So glutathione GST utilizes glutathione as a substrate to catalyze the conjugation reaction for xenobiotic purpose. The recombinant fusion protein containing GST as a tag is being purified with the help of the glutathione coupled matrix. How you are going to do that is that you are going to prepare a column which is having the GST, right? So that's how the protein is actually going to contain the GST tag and the uh, column is going to have the gsh uh, as a ligand so when you purify when you load the lysate it is actually going to bind because there will be an interaction of the gst and gsh and then you are going to have the washing step and ultimately you are going to use the gsh for elution so gsh is going to compete for the uh, for the protein and that's how the gsh will bind to the uh, to the gst which is uh, which has already been tagged with the protein and that's how the protein is going to come out. Uh, after this step, you, you have the option either to remove the tag so that also you can be do you can be able to do with the help of the different types of proteases. Then you could also use the another affinity chromatography which is called as metal affinity chromatography. So in a metal affinity chromatography, we are going to discuss about the nickel NTA affinity chromatography. So first what you have to do is you have to pre prepare the column with the help of a step which is called as charging steps. So what you, the nickel NTA what you are going to get from the vendors is the 
plain uh, columns. Okay, so you're going to get NDA agros or the saffros beads. Then you, within a charging step, you are going to first load the uh, metals onto these beads. Then you're going to load the sample and uh, and then you are going to have the washing steps. And once the washing step is over, then you can do the elution. You can have the multiple options. The mostly people are always using the imidazole as the uh, as the ligand for competition. So you can when you do the imidazole different concentration of the imidazole, imidazole is actually going to uh, have a competition with the histidine which is bound to the nickel and that's how it is actually going to help you to elude the column. Once you've done it with this, you can actually regenerate the column with the help of uh, washing the column with a high salt concentrations. And uh, that's how the, the same column can be, re, uh, can be reused again and again. So we have prepared a small demo clip uh, to explain you how you can be able to perform the nickel NTA uh, affinity chromatography. For uh, protein purification, uh, first we have to inoculate the culture uh, into this uh, larger volume of ERB class, then uh, we will induce it. So first I will show you how to inoculate. This is the single colony grown overnight culture. So we can use for the uh, inoculating into large cultures. So this process should be done in aseptic condition. So that means we have to use laminar airflow for this purpose. So and also we have to remember uh, we, we should include uh, suitable uh, resistant marker like uh, ampicillin or uh, canamycin, this kind of antibiotics. Or this is uh, depends upon what vector, what resistant vector you have, you are having. So in this case, we are using ampicillin uh, as a antibiotic. So let's start. Uh, we have lysed the cells using solication. Now we have to centrifuge the lysate to get supernatant. So that supernatant we load onto nickel NTA column and purify the protein. So I will transfer into 50 ml centrifuge tube, then I will centrifuge. Uh, while the centrifugation is going on, we have to wash the column using first, this is in 20% uh, uh, ethanol. So we have to wash first with water, then uh, equilibration buffer. So, uh, let it drain completely, the 20% ethanol, then we will add water. Uh, double distilled water. So, at least five column volumes of water should be added to remove complete uh, completely. And uh, next, we will equilibrate with the lysis buffer, the buffer which we used for the lysis of the bacterial cells. Before equilibration of the column, uh, we have to uh, charge the column. Nickel NTA, there are two types of bits are there. One is already readily charged bits which comes from company and another one is we have to charge. They will give only uh, NTA agarose bits. So here what we will do is we will charge the bits with the nickel and then we will equilibrate. We already washed the column uh, with water and uh, 0.2 normal NaOH again with water. So now we will equilibrate. So this is a nickel hexachloride solution. So we will keep in the, this condition at least 20 minutes to charge the beads. After that, we will uh, remove uh, nickel NTA. We will elute the nickel 
uh, nickel solution and then uh, equilibrate with the uh, lysis buffer. So after 20 minutes we elevate the uh, nickel solution. Uh, next we will equilibrate with the lysis buffer. We have to wash at least two column volumes to remove any free nickel which exists in the beads. So after equilibration, next step we will load the uh, lysate and then incubate for binding. This is a farafin. Uh, I am going to close this and the pan. So once column packing is over, we have kept it in ice and uh, we will keep in this condition for at least 2 hours for binding. So that uh, histalled uh, protein we will bind to the nickel NDA and uh, in further steps we will allow the protein. After incubation with weeds, uh, we have to follow another 3 steps to get completely purification done. First step is we have to wash with the equilibration buffer. First after uh, the beads taken out from uh, ice you have to you have to remove the outlet so that all the flow through other than beads will be taken out and the next step is we have to wash with the equilibration buffer and the th third step is we have to uh, elude the sample uh, elude the protein uh, histamine protein using imidazole containing buffers all for all these buffers the ph should be adjusted prior hand not like uh, you have to first uh, you take uh, the buffer uh, lysis buffer and you have to add the imidazole it's not like that it may uh, increase the pH of the buffer. So, after combining all the uh, lysis buffer with the imidazole, then we have to adjust the pH so that throughout the procedure the pH won't change. So, this is a flow through, whatever we are getting is flow through. Uh, in next step, we will wash with the uh, in, uh, lysis buffer. In this step, we are going to wash with the uh, lysis buffer or equilibration buffer. So, just this is the lysis buffer. Uh, before doing this, we have to observe the beads we should not directly load onto beads. You just have to uh, pour through corner, uh, through the wall of the uh, column. Otherwise, it may disturb the uh, the beads. So, protein may also degrade. So, this we have to uh, keep in mind while doing this uh, washing. While doing purification, we have to remember that every time you are introducing new buffer, you are introducing new buffer, that time you have to collect the fraction and uh, this can be used for the uh, running SD cells and uh, testing the purity of the samples and also the flow through part and the washing part what we have collected we have to keep it uh, safely after verification of the gel only we have to throw say you are getting only 10% of the protein in your uh, purified fractions 
and the 90 percent of the protein erupting in the flow through. That time you can reuse the uh, flow through for purification, uh, purification and purifying the protein. And so you have to collect the fractions in a small microcentric tubes, and we have to save those fractions. Label it and save. So we washed with the equilibration buffer and we also collected the flow through. Now it's time we will wash with the 20 millimole of imidazole. So this will remove any non-specific proteins binding to uh, the beads. So we will wash with the 20 millimole imidazole containing buffer. Then we will editing subsequently editing uh, 250 millimolar imidazole containing buffer. Final step, we are going to edit with the 250 millimole imidazole containing buffer. So, what we are going to do is we have to incubate uh, beads with this buffer for some time and uh, collect the fractions. Now we have to collect the fractions.
after removing the complete fractions we have to wash the column with water then 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide solution then uh, again water after final wash with the water then we have to store the beads in 20 percent ethanol so i will wash it and store it in the ethanol while the washing is going going on we have to take 50 microliter of each fractions and uh, run it on uh, SDS phase that will give the purity of the fractions We have to heat the samples before loading onto SDS phase. And also, we have to keep this, all these fractions what we have collected at 4 degrees Celsius for further confirmation of the purity. Once the purity is confirmed, we have to dialyze those fractions against the, our buffer of interest, then use for the further studies. So we purified uh, the protein using nickel NDA column. Uh, we run the gel and uh, stained or de-stained. So now it's time to document the gel. So uh, we have to identify whether we got any uh, single band fraction or not. So this is the gel. I kept on a uh, white tray. Now just close it. So we have loaded a marker and uh, this uh, from this side. Second one is the load 
this is flow through wash one wash two and uh, these fractions are eluted fractions one two three four five serially so as we can see uh, the eluted fraction showing a band corresponding to uh, this protein uh, but the molecular weight can be uh, calculated using the software image lab software so as we can see uh, in uh, the protein corresponding to this purification uh, his tagged one it is going most of the fraction in the uh, flow through so we can use uh, as i said in the video earlier we can use this flow through fraction again for purification of the protein you can incubate uh, this flow through with the same beads um, and you can uh, repurify again so that will increase the uh, uh, productivity getting the protein so these are all other bands whatever we are seeing in the protein uh, this uh, eluted bands those are because of the contaminants or uh, degraded protein contaminants sometimes may come because of uh, histidine two or three or four histidine having in folded state that will give uh, possibility to bind to nickel ga column and also washing a vigorous washing should be done if you don't wash properly with a high amount of imidazole that will uh, give you this kind of non specific binding so with this uh, uh, will conclude the video so i hope it will help you to uh, yeah, help you in your work for uh, during protein purification or uh, help you to understand uh, how protein purification works thanks for watching so this is all about uh, the different chromatography technique what we have discussed we have discussed about the ion exchange chromatography, HIC, affinity, and we have also discussed about the gel filtration chromatography. Now the question comes, how you can be able to use these different chromatography techniques for purifying the proteins or the enzymes. So we have taken a couple of examples to explain you how you can be able to utilize these uh, different chromatography techniques for the purification of the enzymes. So first example is that how you can be able to do the enzyme purification from the plant sources. So purification of the enzyme from the plant sources. So we have taken a, uh, the example for the plant which is the Nigella sativa and uh, you first you are going to do the extraction of the substance or the protein. So you can follow the scheme. So you can prepare the water extract of the N sativa and you can try it and make the powder. So powder is going to be dissolved in PBS 6.4. So that is actually going to give you two fractions. It's going to give you the insoluble pellet or it is going to give you the soluble extract. So within the soluble extract, you're going to have the oily layer or the soluble extract. This soluble extract is actually what you're going to use and you're going to dilate that against the, uh, you know, the 0 0.05 molar phosphate buffer using the uh, 3500 molecular weight cutoff and as a result uh, it is actually going to remove all the contaminating substances and you can actually be able to estimate the protein concentration with the help of the Bradford and this is what you are going to use in the chromatography. After this you are going to perform the ion exchange chromatography. So you are going to use a uh, pack the column with the DA saffirose and uh, you're going to then elute with an NaCl gradient uh, at pH 6.4 and you can do the detection of the protein at 280 nanometers and the analyte band protein ranging from the 94 to 10 kDa you can actually be able to use for the uh, monitoring the protein what you have isolated from the plant sources. Then you can also we have taken another example which is where you can actually be able to use that for the animal sources. So purification of the protein from the animal sources. So we have taken the hen egg. So first you are going to do the extraction. So what you are going to do is you take the fresh egg which you are going to collect it. Then uh, you do the isoelectric uh, precipitation of the egg white with the help of the 100 millimolar NaCl. So that is going to give you the two proteins that is ovomucin and the precipitate. 
this precipitate you can just dissolve into the 500 millimolar NaCl with a stirring at 4 degree overnight and that is actually going to give you the some amount of precipitate and the supernatant and that supernatant you can use for the chromatography into the uh, for the use in the chromatography. The supernatant you can load onto a Q sapphorose an ion exchange chromatography and followed by the SP sapphorose which is the cation exchange chromatography. So, remember that in the previous example we have only used the uh, single column of the ion exchange chromatography he, we have you we, you have we have used the two column in uh, tandem actually so isocratic elution of the sample using the 0 0.4 1 molar solution followed by the gradient elutions of the nacl from the anion exchange chromatography the unbound fractions were collected and used as a starting material for the cation exchange chromatography uh, you can use the mass spectrometry to detect the elution of this particular protein from the column and uh, in the analyte what you will see is you are going to get purification of the ova albumin, ova transferrin, lysozymes and at the ovobucine. Now whether you are dealing with the plant sources or whether you are dealing with the bacterial sources or whether you are dealing with the uh, animal sources. The purification strategies are going to be very very fixed. For example, first you are going to take the host cells depending upon whether it is a plant, bacteria or animal, you are actually going to first utilize the disruption method. Okay? So, first you are going to select the disruption method. Uh, you can do the sonications, you can do the thermolysis, you can do the osmotic lysis or you can do the homogenizations. Then what you are going to do is you are going to get the cell homogenate or cell lysate. Right? This cell homogenate first thing what you can do is you can do a ammonium sulphate precipitation. Okay? And that ammonium sulphate precipitation is actually going to give you multiple fractions. Uh, it is going to give you uh, like the 20 percent precipitate it can actually give you 30 percent precipitate, give you the 50 percent precipitate, 65 percent precipitate and also a final supernatant. All of these can be analyzed onto the SDS page. So, you can actually be able to check the uh, you know purification of the uh, enzyme on the SDS page and you can also do the uh, activity of the enzyme. So, you can also do the activity of the enzyme and you can also do the uh, protein uh, concentration. Okay? And that is actually going to be a guiding force whether the purification is going in the right direction or not. Okay? Because if you are doing some procedure and if it is giving you uh, no activity, for example, there will be an activity loss then the purification is not good actually. So, then you have to modify the scheme actually. Now, anyway, once you are done with the amyl precipitation, what you can do is you can take all these fractions. Suppose you, you have the protein in this particular fraction. Okay? So, if you take this fraction and directly you can take this and perform the HIC. So, you can add some more amount of ammonium sulphate. right? Uh, depending on how much ammonium sulphate need uh, you further you have to uh, add so that you can actually be get the you know the you know the uh, exposure of the hydrophobic patches and then you can actually be able to perform the HIC and actually HIC is also going to give you the different fractions and all these different fractions can be another again analyzed for the SDS page for the uh, activity and for the protein concentrations. Now, from HIC different fractions, you can just pull the fractions where you have the protein right, or wherever you have the uh, activity and then these fractions can be first further loaded onto the ion exchange chromatography followed by the gel filtration chromatography. And ultimately what you are going to see is you are going to see a purified enzyme if you are going to optimize all these steps in a meticulous way. Uh, I do not have examples of uh, discussing all these, uh, but uh, you can actually be able to get an idea and you can you know go with this particular scheme. So, first you are going to 
first step you are going to use the you, you're going to select the disruption method so that the host cell is going to be get disrupted second step you are going to do the amino sulfate precipitation so that you are going to have this uh, suitable uh, uh, fraction where the major amount of activity and the protein concentration is present and then from this fraction you can be able to do the hydrophobic interaction chromatography because the major advantage of the HIC just after doing after the amnesophic precipitation is that you do not have to waste the time for the dialysis because if I want to do the ion exchange chromatography after the amnesophic precipitation I have to dialyze and remove the salt right. So that is uh, not required for HIC. Once you got the different fractions you can select the fractions and that selected fraction you can put it for the ion exchange chromatography and then from the ion exchange chromatography selected fractions you can take where the activity is very high you have the minimum number of bands and you or your protein concentration is also very high and then you can put it onto the gel filtration chromatography and while doing so all this you can be able to get the purified protein if you have the any kind of pro antibody ready right then what you can do is you can take the 65 percent cut for example you have the ma major activity in this fraction and you have the antibody which actually can recognize your protein then what you can do is at 65 percent cut you can actually do the affinity chromatography directly because most of the time affinity chromatography we should not do from the crude extract because crude extract is actually going to give you the non-specific binding so better you do the one round of amino sulfate precipitation so that some of the protein which are you know not good for the affinity chromatography can be removed. So this is all about the different chromatography technique and the schemes what you can actually be able to follow to purify the enzymes. What we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, antibody generations in the, uh, in, the, in the mice or the rabbits and then we also discuss about the nickel NTA uh, affinity chromatography also. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about how you can be able to utilize these enzymes in the different types of uh, applications or operations. Thank you. Mm -hmm.